let's say a couple of things before I bring the Ajahn on. I, what I know about the Ajahn, I kind of read on a pamphlet this afternoon. I don't really know a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I could stand there and lie, but I mean, you can tell when someone's lying, can't you? Hopefully. Um, but all, all I know about no disrespect is that the, the uncurrent got interested when he was 17 in Buddhism and he studied and attained his master in theoretical physics in Cambridge. And I think he was ordained in, when he was 23. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I was an obvious Yes. <laughs> And then um, he came over to Australia in 1983, uh, the Western Australian Buddhist society at the moment, and he's now the abbot of the Bodhinyana Monastery in Perth, a um, very renowned uh, monastic institution. And the only thing that, well, one, one of the many things that people told me about that is that he loves to use humour and, and joke, and I'm looking forward to that, so would you please welcome to the stage, Ajahn Brown. Well, thank you, Carl. I like your haircut. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things which I liked about Buddhism when I was very young was that uh, it did have a sense of humour. And I think like spirituality should have that sense of humour as well. Because like laughter is actually something very deep inside. A lot of times when we laugh, we're laughing at ourselves at our stupidity. And much of the laughter is actually uh, some deep insights into the nature of the human condition. And so, from time immemorial, I think people have used laughter as a, a teaching tool. I do remember a Tibetan monk who once said that he likes to make people laugh when he's giving a Dharma talk, because when they've got their mouth open, he can put in the wisdom film. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly, that I think the spirituality today, people expect it to give you happiness. And indeed, one of the wonderful things about Buddhist teaching is they have something called the Four Noble Truths. Basic Buddhism, and what are those Four Noble Truths? What's the first Noble Truth? No. <laughs> I was winding you up and I knew you'd say that. That's what they usually say about the first Noble Truths of suffering. But these days, I put it around a different way, and there's no reason why you can't put it around a different way to do what the traditional Third Noble Truth put that first, and call it happiness. That's it. Do what the traditional Third Noble Truth, we call it happiness, the end of suffering, happiness. The Second Noble Truth is the cause of happiness. The Third Noble Truth is that sometimes we're unhappy, and the Fourth Noble Truth is why we're unhappy. So the whole of Buddhist teachings, if you actually rearrange those Four Noble Truths, is all about happiness, and its cause, and why sometimes we're unhappy. And this makes Spirituality, spirituality relevant to people today because we all want to be happy but sometimes we're unhappy we want to find out why, what we can do about it and one of the reasons why when I became a Buddhist in London I used to go to many different talks with many different teachers sometimes the sort of things which I liked about Buddhism was it's down to earth in the heart business I wasn't really all that interested in books and studies so the talk I'm going to give this evening is not going to be a scholarly talk at all as I recall, one of the first monks who I met as a young man in London, he was a Japanese monk, and he could hardly speak any English. He had to go around with a translator when he was giving his talks, but at the end of his tour of English Buddhist societies, someone asked him, well, what do you think of Buddhism in England? And his answer, his answer in English was very articulate even though he only had a very limited vocabulary. He said, what do I think of Buddhism in England? Books, books, books. Too many, too many, too many. Dustbin, dustbin, dustbin. <laughs> and, and they made a very good point, because spirituality is not out there in the books, it's there in the heart. And this is what Buddhism says. And when I went to the different Buddhist teachers, one of the reasons, actually the main reason, and this is true. One of the main reasons why I decided to become a monk in Thailand was simply that the Thai monks I knew smiled the most. They look to be the happiest people. And I thought, if you are going to follow a spiritual path of religion, and that religion is supposed to be talking about the ending of suffering, arising of wisdom, making you happy, 
I wanted to see the end result in this. So I looked for monks who are happy. And when I saw monks who are happy, I realized that those monks have probably got a lot of wisdom from it to teach me. And that's why I became a monk in Thailand. If you see a miserable monk, if you see a grumpy monk, if you see an angry monk, would you like to follow him? He's the guy who needs to do the learning, not you. For example, when I was a young monk in Thailand, we started to see just how we can create happiness in our lives by changing our attitudes. It's the way we look at life was important in Buddhism, not life in itself, just the way we approach it. For example, in my first year as a monk in Thailand, I wasn't always smiling, not like those other monks. Because I remember, whenever we went from one monastery to another monastery, we would use a ute. The senior monk would be up in the front in the comfortable seats, but the little monks like myself had to go in the back of a ute. And that ute used to have a, a, a metal frame over which was stretched a canopy, a, uh, a piece of canvas, to protect you from the rain or the dust. Now, fortunately, at that time, the Thai people were very small, and I was reasonably big. So, on those roads, the dirt roads, whenever the ute hit a pothole, and that ute went down, I went up. <laughs> and I cracked my head so many times on that metal, hard metal railing, the frame holding the canvas. And in those days, not many Thai monks could understand English. So I could swear in English, and they didn't know what I was saying. <laughs> and I swore many times in English when I cracked my head. But then, sometimes we went into big potholes, and even the small Thai monks hit the head as well. And they never swore. They actually laughed. And at first I couldn't figure out, how can you laugh when you crack your head? I thought that maybe they'd crack their head so many times, they're not really quite right. <laughs> But, as Carl was saying in my little potted biography, before I was a monk, I was a theoretical physicist. So I decided to do an experiment, to do a test. I resolved the next time we went down into a pothole and I hit my head, I would try laughing and see what happened. You know what I discovered? If you hit your head and you swear, it hurts much more than if you hit your head and laugh. If you don't believe me, ask the person sitting next to you to hit you on the head. <laughs> what we're actually doing there is it's not hitting the head, which is the problem. It's the attitude which we have towards it. That is the problem in Buddhism. That's the psychology of the mind which the Buddha saw, and which he taught for many, many years, and which the great teachers throughout the history are always talking about. Little ways of looking at life which solve your problems and make you happy. Now, religion is not something which is just confined to a temple and not just confined to the back of a ute. Religious teachings apply to everyday life. But where do we find a lot of unhappiness in our modern world? In our family. And sometimes in our families because that we argue with each other because we get irritated at each other, because we get angry at each other. And in Buddhism we have some very, very beautiful strategies for dealing with anger. Listen to this story. Many, many years ago, there was a woman who was cooking lunch, and the husband had the afternoon off work, and the wife needed some eggs. So she asked her husband, darling, would you mind going to the market to buy some eggs for me? She said, sure, no worries. He'd never been to the market before, but as soon as he got into the market, this young man came up to him and started calling him terrible names. You've got a face like a camel. You've got a nose like a banana. Now that's what I can say as a monk, because I'm a monk and I've got to behave myself, but he actually said things much worse than that. <laughs> and he abused and scolded this husband, and the husband protested, I don't even know you, I've never done anything to you, why are you shouting at me like this, this is unfair. But no matter what the husband said, this man got angrier, shouted at him and abused him, and, and it was in front of everybody. And it got to the point where the husband couldn't take it any longer. He turned around and went straight home. 
And when he got home, the wife said, Oh darling, you're back early. So yes, I never want to go to that market ever again. You get the egg? No, don't send me back. Now all of those of you who have husbands, you know when they're like that, you've got to sort of calm them down first to get any sense out of them. And when you, when she calmed him down, she said, now husband, who was that man who abused you? Had he described this young man in detail and the wife recognized him straight away, oh it's him. The poor fellow is crazy. When he was very young, he hit his head and he's never been the same again. He can't go to school, he can't go get a job, he just stays in the market every day. And he just abuses everybody, sometimes me, sometimes the storeholders. It's just, he's mad, he's crazy. And as soon as the husband realized that he'd been abused by a crazy man, it didn't really matter anymore. He wasn't so upset. And the wife saw that and told her husband, well, you know, I really do need those eggs. Would you really mind going and getting for me? They said, yeah, okay, don't mind that crazy man. Yeah, I won't mind that crazy man. He went to the market, the crazy man came up to him again, shouted at him, scolded him, cursed him, abused him. But it didn't matter now, because he was crazy. And the husband knew he was crazy. He walked right up to the egg store, the man was abusing him in front of everybody, and the owner of the egg store said, don't mind him, he's crazy. He hit his head, yes, I just heard poor He can't get a job, isn't it a shame? And he abused him all the way out of the market. It didn't matter because the guy was crazy. Now when the Buddha told that story, he said, if that's your husband who's abusing you, we call him Buddhism temporary insanity. He's crazy. <laughs> He's out of his mind. If it's your wife who calls you face or whatever, ah, oh, she's just crazy. She must have hit her head that morning. Don't take it seriously. Because all anger and abuse is just that. Temporary insanity. So, when someone abuses you, or tells you names, or calls you names, why is it that we react and allow another person's speech to take away our happiness? What well, Buddhism was saying, no matter what another person says about you, there's no right to control your happiness. Don't let them take away your happiness. You can be happy no matter what another person says to you. And look at me, the way I dress. And these monks behind me. This is the only dress we have, you know. We don't have other dress to wear other occasions. I went to went to hospital in Perth for seven days. And when I checked in, they said, where's your pyjamas? I said, monks don't have pyjamas. It's either these or nothing. Take your choice. And they said, we'll take these. <laughs> <laughs> On another occasion, I was being taken to a... Uh, into town by one of our drivers and uh, we parked in one of these multi-story car parks in Perth and the driver had to use the toilet and he refused to use the toilet in the multi-story car park because it was dirty and so he said he knew there was a toilet in the foyer of one of the cinemas so we walked there, he went into the toilet and I stood outside in my robes I'd only been standing out there for a few minutes when this man came up to me and he asked me, have you got the time? Now as a monk, I mean, you don't wear watches, so I said naively, no, I don't have the time. And then he looked at me in a very strange way. And I suddenly remembered that, have you got the time, is one of the oldest pickup lines in the world. <laughs> that driver had left me in one of Perth's most famous gay pickup points. <laughs> And this man walked a little bit further, and he turned around and said in the most effeminate voice, Oh, but you do look beautiful in those robes. <laughs> <laughs> and so what do I do when people do that to me? Do you get upset and allow them to take away your happiness? No, you laugh and tell everyone else about it. Like the other time when I was being driven in a, in a car down a, a freeway, it was actually a highway, a three-lane highway, and some you know, some young lads. They saw there were some monks in the car. It was a hot day in the summer. And they saw there were some young, there were some monks and they started to have some fun. They drew alongside me going along the highway. I had my window down. I was in the passenger seat. And the kids in the car opened down the window and they called out to me. And so I looked. And they had a magazine open. And they were looking say, look at this. Playboy. <laughs> I didn't look. 
honest. <laughs> but I tell those stories because if somebody laughs at you, if somebody laughs, and you laugh as well, then no one ever laughs at you. They only laugh with you. Do you understand? If you make a fool of yourself, an idiot, and people start laughing, and if you don't laugh, they're laughing at you. If you laugh at yourself, and they laugh at you, then they're just laughing with you. And that's a completely different ball game. So why allow people to control your happiness? The law of karma in Buddhism, which is a, a powerful teaching in Buddhism, is you are in control of your happiness, no one else. You can't blame other people if you're unhappy. It's not your husband's fault, your wife's fault, your parents' fault, not even the government's fault, not even Mr. Bush's fault. It's your fault. <laughs> because if you start blaming other people for your suffering, not understand the law of karma, in Buddhism, according to my teacher, Rajan Shah, blaming other people is like having an itch on your head and scratching your bottom. <laughs> now think about it. If you've got an itch on your head and you scratch your bottom, is that itch never going to go away? Actually, you get two itches where once you have one. If you blame another person, you think it's their fault, you're making double suffering. So what you actually say in Buddhism is that the law of karma means you're responsible for your happiness, not other people. If you get upset because of what somebody says, you have an hour to, to take away your happiness. You don't have to do that. If you allow life to upset you, you hit your head, you can laugh. And then you don't hurt so much. It's one of attitudes of mind. And when I saw some of the great monks in Thailand, and I saw how they related to life's problems, I realized that they had a secret which I wanted, and that was Buddhism. The way to have happiness in your life, no matter what is happening. It's very easy to be happy when things go well for you. But can you be happy when life gets really very difficult? When things go wrong? If you have some understanding of Dhamma, you can always make use of every experience in life. I usually use the simile of the truck load of Dhamma. That simile goes like this. It's how you make use of things in life. It's as if you come to a nice talk like this. You have a wonderful time and enjoy yourself immensely. And you go back home and you find that somebody has dumped a whole big truckload of dung right in front of your door. Now there's two things about that dung. First, you didn't order it. It's not your fault. And number two, no one saw it coming, they didn't take down the details of the van, so you can't bring up anybody to take it away. You are stuck with it. So the two things about the dung, it's not your fault, but you're stuck with it. Now there's two things that people do with dung which comes in front of their doors. The first type of person takes some of that dung and puts it in their bags, in their pockets, like their shirts, down their skirts, and they carry it around with them. And you find if you carry around dung, you lose a lot of things. <laughs> But in that simile, carrying around the dung means when life gets difficult for you, when you have problems, when life doesn't go the way you think it should, maybe you lose your job, your relationship splits up, maybe you're even diagnosed as having a cancer, a life-threatening disease. Do you know that story about the man who went to the doctor and the doctor said, I'm sorry, sir, you've got cancer, you've only got one month to live. And the man replied, Doctor, I don't think I will be able to pay your bill in one month. <laughs> so the doctor said, OK, I'll give you two months to live in. <laughs> so I can tell James two times. So uh, when these things happen, that we can carry around the dug in our life, it means that when things go wrong, we complain about it, we get angry about it, we get upset about it, we get depressed about it. It's quite natural to do that, but you don't have to do that. There is an alternative to carrying around the gun. I think many of you who have heard this story before know that alternative. Instead of carrying around the gun, you actually dig it into your garden. So the gun 
very smelly, offensive stuff is tremendous fertilizer. You sometimes you can only manage maybe one wheelbarrow a day. But you dig it in. Day after day after day. Sometimes it takes years. Until one day a miracle happens. In front of your door is no more done. And in your garden, you've got these amazing flower beds. They are so more beautiful. And the scent is more fragrant than the flowers next door. And you've got fruit of apples, mangoes, or whatever. And your fruit is so abundant and so much more sweet than anything you can buy in the supermarket. And where did all that sweetness and all the fragrance of the flowers come from? It all came from the dam which you dug into your garden. The dam is the difficult experiences we have in our life. The flowers are the flowers of compassion and kindness which we grow in our lives. The fruit is the fruit of wisdom and understanding because if you have really been through tremendous disappointment, suffering, trauma, if you've been through it and dug that down in, my goodness, you've got compassion and wisdom which other people just do not have. You can actually put your arm around somebody who's in the same situation. And you can say, I know, with integrity and force. Not only can you say, I know, you can also help that person through the problem, out to the other side, because you've been there. That's why we call the unpleasant experiences of life to fertilizer for our wisdom, fertilizer for our compassion. We don't complain about it, but we make use of it. An old Chinese saying is, rather light a candle than complain about darkness. How much sense that makes. And how often we just complain, 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 and we never actually light the candle which brings light to ourselves and to others. So what Buddhism is all about is actually making use of these things, because this is what karma means. And if you make use of these things, then the karma will lessen the pain and the suffering of life and bring you more happiness in life. Some years ago I was visiting a Tibetan nun in Perth who was dying of cancer. I've been visiting her many, many weeks, and she gave a call at my monastery saying she thought she was about to die. She said she thought maybe one or two days. And the strange thing is, it happens very often, that they were absolutely right. In one or two days, she did die. So I went to see her for the last time. I drove all the way from my monastery, which was over an hour, stopped what I was doing. It was very difficult to get a driver to actually to get me to the monastery, uh, to the hospice, sorry. And when I got to the hospice, you had to check in with the head nurse, first of all. When I checked in with the head nurse, I said I was visiting this Tibetan man, which is an Australian, but more than the Tibetan tradition. And the nun said, I'm very sorry, but she had given absolute orders that no visitors should interfere with her peace. I said, look, she can't have said that because she just rang me about an hour ago. She said, no, we must respect our patient's wishes. It's one of the very officious nurses, but I wouldn't give in. I'd come all that way. And so I said, no, no, she must have said, okay, because look, she rang me up only an hour ago. I've come all this distance. And this nurse got very angry at me. And she glared at me and said, come over here. And she dragged me to, almost to the door. And there on the door of this nun's room was a big sign saying, absolutely no visitors. And the nurse said, see, absolutely no visitors. And I looked, and actually a small print underneath was except had the umbrella. And I said, see? <laughs> it's very happy, one of my happiest moments, don't you <laughs> So when I went into the room, I asked the nurse, said, why is it that you actually put that notice on the board of your room? Why didn't you want anyone else to visit? And what she said was very important. She said, well, listen, so that you are the only one who comes into this room and actually treats me as a person, not as somebody dying. You're the only one who comes and tells me jokes. Wasn't that this joke, I said, well, because everybody else, she knows she's dying. Everybody else, the nurses, the doctors go in there and treat her as a dying person. I treated her as a person, which is very different. 
I'm treated her as if she was a normal person. Forget about dying. She's heard that all day. She wants to hear something else. So when you go and visit a sick relation or friend, how many of you, when you go to the hospital bed, say, how are you feeling today? What a stupid question. <laughs> if she was feeling well, she wouldn't be in hospital, would she? <laughs> and that's the last thing. That, that's what the doctors and nurses keep saying every day. So talk about something else when you go and visit someone in hospital. Talk to the person, not the sickness. And this is actually just how we use these wide attitudes of Buddhism to actually bring happiness and bring peace and bring understanding. Because are you your sickness? Or are you something more than that? In Buddhism we actually look very, very deeply at the nature of life. So often we have a problem and we think that that's all there is to life. Just the problem. We never see that there's something much more than the problem which we're dealing with. And this is actually why people suffer so much. We exaggerate the difficulties and problems of life. For example, with the young monk in Thailand, I used to sit meditation in the jungles without any mosquito nets, sitting down on a, a rush mat. And in those jungles, there are many dangerous animals. There were elephants, tigers, and snakes. I was told when I first went, went to Thailand, there are hundred species of snake in Thailand. Ninety-nine are venomous. If they bite you, you're in big trouble. And the other ones strangled you to death. <laughs> so they're all very, very dangerous. And I remember, and the worst of that sometimes are tigers. They're not just man-eating tigers. There are in Thailand monkeys and tigers. And you sit meditation and you close your eyes. And after a while you hear a sound. There's something coming towards you. You really check with your mindfulness. Is this a small animal or a big animal? And it's very strange. After a while, with paying a lot of attention, not being stupid, you'll be sure that was a big animal coming towards you. In fact, you could hear it coming, and it was not an ordinary big animal. That was a huge animal. If that was a tiger, that must be a big one. By that point, out of fear, I'd open my eyes. And what did I see? It wasn't even a big mouse, it was only a tiny one. <laughs> that happened so often. Why was it that happened? Because when it's fear, you exaggerate the problems enormously. With the eyes closed and in fear, you find that small things assume huge proportions because of fear. Now, what happens when you go to the doctor and they say, you've got cancer? Fear makes that problem huge. So why have fear? Why not do we look upon these things as part of life? There's more done for our garden. More things we can learn from. I do teach cancer patients regularly in Perth in the Cancer Support Association where I go at least twice a year. And very often people tell me, and I'm sure that you've heard people say this, that the cancer was the best thing that ever happened to them. They learned about life. They learned about what was really important. They grew. Listen to this story. There was a man in Sydney some years ago. He was a businessman. He used to go to see the doctor every year to have his annual checkup. But he was very healthy. And one day, a couple of days after his checkup, he received a telephone call at home from his doctor. The doctor's first question was, Is your wife there? The way he said it was, Uh oh, something's wrong. So he asked the doctor, give it to me straight, doc, what's happened? And the doctor says, the results from the blood test have just come back from the lab. They've discovered a very rare form of cancer, and unfortunately it was untreatable. He asked, he didn't feel ill at all. He asked, how long? The doctor said, he never tell how long. Maybe two months, three months, but I don't think he'll live out a year. 
And the man took it very well, very philosophically. It was a bolt from the blue as these things often are. He sat down with his wife and talked it over. Like many business people, he'd always promised his family, his two children and his wife, to go on one of these amazing, wonderful tours of Europe. But he could never find the time. Now he was about to die. He decided he would make that time. He sold his business within a few days, not the best price, but a good enough price. And he bought first class tickets to this amazing tour of Europe for his wife and his two children. And apparently he had those tickets in his hand when the doctor rang a second time. And said, it's a true story. He said, I don't know how to tell you this. Two people with the same surname. The results will be mixed up. You're perfectly healthy. <laughs> He went on that trip overseas. He had a wonderful time. And the thing, the last I heard of him, he was actually at some truck stop in around Gorbon Way. And he became a wonderful man as a result of that shock. Because that shock taught him about the meaning of life. When he realized he was about to die, that he took his life into the right perspective. What was really important was not the money, it was his family, his friends. What spirituality does, and the reason why that spirituality, religions like Buddhism will always be popular in this world, is because they give more importance to what really is deserving of more importance. The peace in your heart, the well-being in your family, the happiness, rather than your wealth, than your pain. If one knows that, one knows why. Buddhist monks, without any money, smile a lot. You'll understand just why the purpose of life is the path of happiness. And that was what the Buddha was talking about. How to be happy. Why we suffer. And how not to suffer. And that's a little introduction. A little taste of happiness. A taste of freedom. Which is all about what Buddhism truly is. So I'm going to finish there because we have another session coming up from Ajahn Yana Dhamma. Who's going to say more about how to be happy? So thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. I want to hang up Yeah, great. Which barber do you go to? Which barber? Yeah, I go to the barber and hang up soon. Barber? I don't know you, sir. I just give you a blessing or maybe anything from you. I just like to say, the bouncing of the head on the thing, I don't swear. Yeah, come on. When I went back to the front of the head and I don't laugh, I cry.
and then you have Dano for the deputy to uh, Ajahn Brahm at the one screen in Western Australia from 9 4 to 2002. That's not bad, I'm going to get that. And he's been gathered at uh, the, the International One Screen in Thailand uh, since 2002. So, um, would you please welcome him? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I'm going to end up in my words. I have to take a second. Carl <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> is complaining about the uh, microphone. I'm complaining about the stand. I can step up. I've been injured my foot uh, from jumping over the monster wall. And <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought I had to talk about the monk who jumps over the wall. The only saving grace I had was that I was jumping into the monastery on the house. I do say the grace based on that. Um, but uh, yes, it's made me thought about paths and uh, particularly about uh, shortcuts in life. Because I was trying to take a shortcut, and I think sometimes we all do that in life. We try to take Shortcuts, and sometimes the shortcut ends up being the long way around. And what was going to be a very quick trip over the wall ended up uh, being six months. And uh, I, uh, one of my meditation teachers seems to think I was trying to fly. Um, <laughs> that's maybe one of the benefits of meditation, but I haven't learned that yet. Uh, so I am here to maybe speak to you about uh, paths and uh, the path in life. And as I want to uh, mention about the path in a path of happiness. Uh, I would uh, tend to disagree with us and what I want to on that. And <laughs> <laughs> having lived with him for eight years and having to say yes all the time, <laughs> I've decided that now I'm an abbot and I'm another monastery. I can say no sometimes. <laughs> uh, so tonight I'm going to say no. Uh, the path is not a path of happiness. It's a path of contentment. And uh, you may come back and say, well, that's one of the same thing. After living together for eight years, we know each other very well. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, uh, events that I remember when I was in Thailand, uh, our teacher at Cha, was uh, an occasion when a man came to the monastery complaining. And he came to see the Cha and he said, I'm fed up. I'm fed up with my wife. <clears throat> I'm fed up with my work. I'm fed up with my family. I'm fed up with everything. I've had enough. And Asan Cha said, No, you're not fed up. Yeah. Much like a disagree. <laughs> we like to throw these things out of the left field, make people think about them, and I can tell was very good at that. He said, no, you're not set up, you're um, angry. Uh, because if you've got a younger wife, you probably wouldn't be fed up with her anymore. If you've got a bigger house, you probably find a bit more delight in that, got a better job, you'll pay, you'd be happier. You aren't set up the same way the Buddha was set up. And uh, so this man said to him, what can I do? And I said, I'm going to teach you meditation. He said, I'm fed up with meditation. <laughs> and I said, I know you're fed up with meditation, but I'm going to teach you a new form of meditation. And he said, look, I've done meditation on the breath, I've done meditation on life, I've done all forms of meditation. I'm fed up with meditation. And then I said, I want you to meditate on it's good enough. Then you go back home and see your wife. She's good enough. Then you go to work. It's good enough. When you see your house, it's good enough. When you see your children, they're good enough. On each in breath, each out breath, I want you to say, it's good enough. 
And if you do that, then you find a deep degree of contentment in life, which will overcome your anger and frustration. And he did. He went away. And a month later, I saw him when he came back. And he's a different person. He has focused on his good enough. And he says, I can change my life. Yes, my life is good enough. And yes, my situation. When I look at it from a different angle, it is. It's not perfect. There's always something wrong. There is difficulty, there is pain. But it's the attitude of mind that we take that situation that I've learned from you. So this evening, if you remember anything, I want you to remember not only bronze jokes, but it's good enough. I can't tell you how much talk was good enough. <laughs> Probably even better. Our meditation is that the Thai used to say that uh, uh, Buddhism or truth or Dhamma is food for the heart. Ajahn Brahm was just the entree. <laughs> <laughs> this is the real meal. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> uh, why if I, this is going to be perfect, I just said, and I'm, I'm leaving. Sydney tomorrow to go back to Thailand, so I think I can get away with this. <laughs> um, one of the things that uh, I think is a uh, path, the path is the path, it is very important to develop a sense of contentment. And the contentment has to grow. And grow in uh, being content with who we are and the situation. Now, many people misunderstand that. And they think that I don't have to do anything to them about the problems in the world, that I, I, we don't need to do anything about these injustices. Now that's not it. We do. And we do it a hundred percent. But also we learn how to be content with the present moment. And also content with oneself. To learn how to become one's own best friend is very important. <laughs> And to illustrate this, I would like to tell the story uh, of the emperor. Uh, this emperor uh, was uh, very interested in philosophy. He had some existential problems which were mad in his mind. Couldn't find any peace. And the first question that was hanging on his mind is, who is the most important person in the world? And of course, the Hindu emperor, uh, having mighty power, everyone will say, of course, you're the most important person in the world. And other people say, no, your parents are the most important person in the world, because that's who gave you birth. Other people say, no, it's who you married, because she could make your life either happy or very miserable. We said that's some wrong thing, so I judge in this, uh, um, uh, talk, I have to also say you, uh, I judge. What's the three rings of marriage? Um, when you're married, you get given an engagement ring, then you're given the wedding ring, and then after that, you're given suffering. <laughs> and then, so, uh, that's a Buddhist joke. Mark to tell that one all the time. <laughs> and uh, the fifth emperor wanted to know who is the most important person in my life? And it is, that is an important question to ask. And I'm sure many of you have asked that. The other thing that he wanted to know was, what is the most important time in my life? You can emperor people say, uh, when you are born, you are born into a royal, royal family, what is the best thing to do the time? Uh, when you are coronated, when you enter, I'm just sitting in my life, it's no, 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 as uh, when you get married, etc., etc. And so he got many different responses to that question. The next question that was really growing on his mind is, what is the most important thing to do with my life? Um, that's an important one, isn't it? That's what got me into the road to. One reason why is the most important thing to do with one's life. 
And uh, many people said the embryo can get wealth, others say get power, others say it's too good. And again, he was confused. Many different answers. He heard one day about a very wise sage. And it's not a Buddhist monk, it was just uh, an adept of this story. Heard about a very wise sage, sage living in a cave on top of a mountain. He knew all the answers to all questions. And so he decided to go and see that sage. He sent that, and he headed off with his uh, army and so got to the base of the mountain thinking, oh, we shouldn't go up and see these religious people with our army and our mobile phones. I'll take those uh, things away and uh, put them aside. And he headed up the mountain dressed as a peasant. And he got uh, to the cave. And because he'd been a king, it had taken a lot longer to walk up the mountain. It wasn't very deep. It was a lot longer to get there than expected. He got to the cave and it was getting dark. So being a man who's in a hurry, he decided, I want to get the answer to these ultimate truths very quickly. I'll rest and ask my questions and get off. And I'm thinking that probably many of you are doing the same thing. Uh, I'll get these answers to these ultimate truths this evening, $25, and then I'll rush off. <laughs> Get on with them. And so this uh, emperor rushed into the cave and he saw the sage sitting very blissfully on the rock, meditating. And being a busy man, he <coughs> coughed. <coughs> and this sage sat this time and he still on the rock. And then he thought, he must have heard me. He coughed again. <coughs> peaceful person who sat very still on the rock. The sage, had to, the sage not taking any notice of the king, made him very upset. He talked for a last time, <coughs> and again, no response. So he turned to leave, and then he found out that it was already nightfall. He had to spend a long night in the cave with the sage. And I'm sure if uh, we locked the doors here and you had to spend a long night in this hall with many sages uh, sitting in this hall, you would find the same degree of discomfort. And then he um, decided that uh, he's going to actually do this. He was too dangerous to go down the mountain and that. And he got through the whole night. And dawn. The sage was still sitting on the rock and moved. Then the emperor, seeing it was gone, rushed down on the cave and there was a great cliff and he got to the edge of the cliff in front of the cave and he saw the sunrise. And being a very busy man, he hadn't had the opportunity to see nature very often. And he saw the sunrise and was struck by its natural beauty. And he felt a sense of freedom of all the responsibilities he carried around a long time. And he was standing there enjoying the beauty of the sea when he heard someone cough behind him. <coughs> and he turned around and there was a sage holding a sword. Just for drama. <laughs> holding a sword pointing the sword at his throat. And he couldn't step back because he'd fall off the cliff. And he couldn't go forward and have his head struck cut off. And the sage said, O oh, mighty king, who is the most important person? <laughs> what is the most important time? What is the most important thing to do? And being presented with those questions and the alternative being there, his mind stopped. And he realized the most important person is the person who is. 
and the most important time is the here and now. And also, the most important thing to do is to not be heedless of the here and now. You to take great care with the person you're with, and to take great care with the here and now. And so, realizing that, the sage put down the sword and went back and sat on the rock. And the king went away and administered his kingdom very wisely. So now, hearing that story, we'll be able to go back to your kingdoms and administer them very wisely by caring for the person you're with. If you are alone, then you have great care for yourself, great compassion for oneself, to be a friend to oneself. And likewise, when you discover. So right now, the most important people in our lives is every single person in this room. They're the people that we should care for, and that is compassion. And they are the people which we should not be heedless towards. And this present moment, not when we get up and leave, not when Carl tells his next joke, but right now is the most important time. And this is the time we need to be careful, careful about this moment, because it will leave us. We are getting older. When I jumped off the wall and hit the rock in the grass, which I didn't see, I realized I wasn't 21, I was going on 50, with the estimate getting older. Sitting here, and we're aging. So we have to be very careful to take note of the present moment. And if we do this, then we're developing what we call awareness, and this is a part of the path. We need to be aware of the pathway to peace and the pathway to contentment. And we notice that, don't we? When we care for the present moment, when we are heedful of the present moment and care for the people around us, then contentment arises. And that contentment leads to peace. In the Buddha's teachings, the teachings which is aimed at peace, aiming towards contentment, the overcoming of desire. And one of the things that made uh, Atan Chah a very unique meditation teacher is that he would ask the right questions. And it's very important that we become our own great teacher, our own sage, by asking the right questions. When we're discontent, we ask, what do I want? Why am I discontent? And listen to the response. Because the Buddha said, if we are discontent, it's because we either want something or want to get rid of something. Usually one or the other. And if we ask them, why am I discontent? Then we can see it's a reaction between those two processes. <clears throat> to get something or to get away from something. And if um, we're mindful and aware, we can catch that process and give up that movement for rejection or attachment and let go. In Asia, they have this very skillful way of trapping monkeys. A hunter wants to trap a monkey, they drill a hole in an empty old coconut shell, tie a string on it, and then make another hole in the side of the coconut shell, just big enough for a monkey to put its hand in. And then they put some sweet smelling uh, sweep inside that coconut shell. Then they tie uh, the rope 
to the tree and have that coconut with the sweet in the shell tied firmly to the tree and wait for the monkeys to come. And when the monkeys come along and smell the sweets, they go up and put their hand in the holes and grasp hold of the sweet. And what happens when you grasp hold of something, you cling to something, the fish gets too big for the hole. So when the monkey wants to pull